Welcome once again to our YouTube channel. Thanks for subscribing to our channel. We really appreciate it all. Uh, today we will quickly be looking at some tips, few tips on answering biology practical questions. We want to prepare our students that are uh, embarking on their WAEC, on their SSC exams, on ways on how best to answer practical questions in biology. So we'll be looking at uh, majorly uh, three directions. We'll be looking at the diagrams. We'll be looking at uh, differences, differentiation between uh, specimens. We'll also be looking at cuts, how to identify cuts, longitudinal cuts, uh, uh, transverse cuts, and the rest of those. We'll be looking at experimentation, how to record an experiment. So those are the things that we will be looking at. The first thing I said is that we'll be looking at the drawings and diagrams. Drawings slash diagrams and how to label them correctly. We will also be looking at differentiations, differentiations and, simi and similarities. Differentiations and similarities. Similarities, it will suffice to tell us that these are few of the things that used to fail students in the SSE exam. We also be looking at cuts. We have different types of cuts. We have the longitudinal cuts, we have the transverse cuts. So we'll be looking at those as well. We we'll as well be looking at uh Experimentations. Experimentation. Perhaps you have uh, a question that has you or needs you to carry out an experiment. How do you go about them? How do you even put down your results? Those are the things that we will be looking at in a few minutes. So before we go further, I would quickly want us to understand that you will be seeing a link ahead of you. The link that is showing uh, above the screen right now, uh, please click on it to subscribe to our page as well as you uh, accessing other uh, videos that we have uploaded on this channel to aid your learning, particularly for the uh, incoming WAEC examination. Now, I said we'll be talking about the diagrams, differentiations, uh, that's the uh, differentiation uh, between uh, organisms or substances, specimens that are being given, and then similarities that you can come across, how you can identify them, and then we'll be talking about cuts as well as experimentation. Now, let us quickly pick it up from the diagrams. Diagrams. So that is where we are starting or kicking it off from, the drawings and the diagram. Drawings and diagrams. Now, at this point, I need to, I need, uh, to make us understand that it is supposed to be very, very easy for students to pass biology practical. But because they are unable to follow strictly the guidelines that will be given, that is why it seems difficult for students to pass biology practical. It is supposed to be one of the easiest things to come across and to pass through with uh, flying colors in the SSE exam. Now, I want us to get this right. In grading the diagram that is being drawn, examiners have some things that they actually look out for. And it is these things that we will quickly be uh, highlighting one after the other now. The first one is talking about the size of the diagram. We have the first one talking about the size of the diagram. size of diagram. Now, this is what this is talking about. Oftentimes, you will come across a question that will tell you to draw a diagram, draw a diagram that is 8 to 10 centimeters long. Yes, that is 8 to 10 centimeters long, a diagram. Draw a diagram that is 8 to 10 centimeters long long now this is what is expected of you you will probably be given an answer sheet that is already graded that already has lines as we have on this particular sheet here you can see this is line one line two line three line four line five line six line seven so you are permitted to count 
if I am to draw 8 to 10 cm long diagram, I will count such that I will know that this is where my diagram is starting. I have this place here to be where the starting point of my diagram is. I will use a ruler to measure in this direction such that I'll be having in this direction like this. Well, let me use something else to map that. I will have the direction horizontally like this to be about 8 to 10 centimeter long. So I could what, choose 9, I can choose 10. And then I will mark again from this direction here. From here, I map again down till I have 8 to 10 centimeter long. Let's assume after count after mapping with my ruler, this is where my 8 to 10 centimeter is getting me to. And then from here again, I rule horizontally another 8 to 10 centimeters. And then I have this. So it is more or less going to make it look like uh, uh, a, a rectangle or a square. But you're not permitted to rule line like I have just done. You're not permitted to rule line like I've just done. So what is expected of you is to have something that looks like this. Let's see. You have something that looks like this. You have a fresh page like this. So you get your ruler and your pencil. You map. Let's assume this is your starting point here. And then you rule in this direction. You map having your ruler measuring in the horizontal direction and let's assume this is where the 10 centimeter gets to so at that point you map as well this is your 10 centimeter i believe we can see what i am doing this is our point a this is our point b and then from our point a we map down vertically to measure another 10 centimeter such that we'll be having something that it takes us to this point Let's assume it takes us to this point. And then we have another one measured from point B here vertically. That is from this point here vertically down and mapping the, 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 the diagram is, I mean, the uh, line is going to match with this one that is at the base by the left. So we'll be having another point here. So what we're saying in essence is whatever diagram you want to draw, should be able to fit into this place. Your diagram should be able to fit into this place like this. Yes, your diagram should be able to fit into this place such that you have the diagram towards the left. You can see that the diagram is drawn towards the left of my uh, mapped area. And then I have this little space here for my labeling. And so when I want to label, I, I will use my pencil and my ruler to map out straight grid lines like this. Straight grid lines like this. It must be very, very straight. You shouldn't use freehand sketch. It is not expected. It is not permitted for you to use freehand sketch at this very point. Every grid line must be very, very straight. And on no condition must you cross any grid line. What I'm saying is, let's look at this. Let's assume I have a diagram drawn here. Let's assume I have a diagram drawn here. Let's assume I have something that looks like this. Let's assume I have something that looks like this. And here I have this, I have this, I have this, let's assume I have this again. Now, I want to label this. This is what is expected of you. You get your pencil and your ruler and you map from the top. You look at the closest organelle uh, to the top of the diagram. And that is where you start your labeling from. Now, make sure that your labeling, your, your grid line rather, touches or it touch the particular organelle that you are trying to label. So, I have something like this. 
Then this is my next organelle that I want to label. So I have, okay, let me pick this one next. I have something like this. Then this is my next organelle. I have something like this. This is my next organelle. I have something like this. This one happens to be my next organelle. I have something like this. And this is my last organelle. I have something like this. Now, if you look at this grid line, you find out that all of them are having uh, equal edge. That is what is expected of you. So, peradventure, you have drawn any of the lines to be longer than the others. Let's assume I have drawn something here and it is longer than the others. What is expected of you is to get your eraser and you quietly, gently erase it so that it can all have equal edge. That is what is expected of you that all the grid lines must have equal edge and then you can start labeling that this is your this one here is your cell wall this one is let's assume you have it to be the cytoplasm you have this one here to be the mitochondria you have this one to be the cell vacuole, oh sorry, let me use that one as the ribosome. This one here is the ribosome. Then this one here is the cell membrane. And here we have the vacuole. And this one here underneath. We can call it, let's say, that is the uh, nucleus. Let's assume that is the nucleus. Now, you can see that all of the labelings, they are in the same direction. We have all of the labelings in, uh, with the grid lines pointing directly to each of the labelings. And on no condition must you put an arrowhead to your grid line. There is no need for... A arrow head. Now, all of the grid lines are directly touching the organelle to which they are was drawn out from. So you must make sure that your grid line touch the organelle that you are drawing them from. It is very, very important. It is very, very important that you do that. Now, after labeling, I'm just trying to give us a uh, quick uh, brief on what to do. So the size of the diagram is very, very important. Make sure the size spans across the 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 uh, particular dimension that is being given to you so if you were given this as an example you have your diagram drawn across or uh, covering the mass of the sheet that is being given to you and then underneath your diagram that is where you are permitted to write your ta the, the the tag or the title of your diagram that is where you have the title of your diagram stately, uh, clearly stated and you must try as much as possible the title or the caption of the diagram is stated here underneath it in capital letter let's assume you have well okay let me use this diag this color you have well labeled diagram of a whatever you have drawn so let's quickly have let's quickly see how possible that is so we've been given a particular diagram to draw let's assume this is the page that you were given and now you have give, you have you were told to draw 8 to 10 centimeter long diagram you have the opportunity to count 10 lines because it is assumed that each of these uh, lines is a centimeter. So if we are starting from here, if this is our first line, so we have one, two, three. What I'm saying is we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So we can have that as our 10 centimeters. And then we count horizontally as well. So let's assume our 10 centimeter is lapsing here and here. And here so our diagram is expected to be in the middle of it here so we have our diagram drawn let's assume we have something that looks like this we have something that looks like this uh, 
and then we have this Now I need us to understand at this point that this is a freehand sketch. You don't need you don't need any kind of uh, perfect circle. We just need to understand that you know what you're actually doing. So we have something that looks like this. So let's assume you have this. Now, you have drawn your diagram. Now it is time for you to label. You get your pencil and start labeling. So we start by doing this. Get your pencil and you label. You draw your grid line out. That is our first the label. Then this is our second label. Our grid line. We have this place to be the third we have uh, this place here to be the fourth. Let's assume I've drawn the line beyond uh, the expected circle. And I have, okay, let me put this one here. And I have this place here to be this length. And then I have this one here. Now we have the opportunity to start labeling. This place here is my stock so first first and foremost i get my eraser and i make a perfect edge of my grid lines you can see now that my uh grid lines they have a perfect edge and so i can start labeling are we together now i can start labeling so my first label is going to be the stock that's my first label, after which uh, this one is called the epicap. This is the epicap. And then, then I have my mesocap. So this place is labeled mesocap. Mesocap. And then we have this other part here to be the seed. This place is labeled seed. And then... We have this part here labeled seed coat. This place is seed coat. And then we have this place here to be the endo cap. The endo cap. Now, the more the labeling, the better your diagram. So we have just labeled, so we now have the opportunity to make uh, the name. So we can say, well labeled diagram or a well uh, a diagram of the longitudinal section of a mango fruit illustration of the longitudinal section of a mango fruit diagram showing the longitudinal section longitudinal section of mango if you have space you can still write fruit and then you gently underline you can see that I wrote them in capital letters you underline and that is how your diagram is to be and then you should be able to put uh your magnification what kind of magnification have you used if your magnification is let's say the same size with your diagram so you have the opportunity to put it down there so what you do is this you write mg mg and then you put your magnification so for this type of uh, diagram let's assume my diagram is the same size with the specimen that is being given you can just write times one but if you have magnified it let's assume you have increased the size by two folds then it is going to be times two or times ten depending on and if you are using a microscope for example to view an object 
the microscope usually have different lenses and each of the lenses have magnification too if the magnification of the lens you are using is a times 100 lens magnification so that is going to be your uh, mg so it is going to be times 100 so that is how that is done so that is that about that so the size of diagram matters a lot so you notice that the examiner will record the diagram by actually putting something like this you see the diagram uh, the examiner writing something like this s beside it that is telling you the size of the diagram then we have clarity of line if you look at all of the lines that i've drawn here i do not have something that makes it look like my lines are woolly something that looks like this huh? something that looks like this that i have here no the line must be even if it is not a perfectly straight line you don't we, we, it is not finite so we don't expect your lines to be perfectly straight so what we are saying is it must be a straight line it must be uh, a line that is without wool if it is going to be like this that is okay it must not have any form of wavy lines that is about the clarity of the line then the neatness of the label your label must be neatly done you can see how these labelings are done and you can see that each of the grid line assigns each uh, uh it, it, you can tell which grid line is assigned to a particular organelle of the diagram and then the particular label that is assigned to that grid line so you must make sure that your diagram is neatly done and your label is neatly done aha uh -huh. then i talked about horizontal lines so you must make sure that under no condition should you have your lines drawn across one another let's assume this for this particular diagram this one here yeah, i have this particular part this middle part here yeah, i have it labeled as vacuole but before i labeled it as vacuole imagine i brought the label in like this and i brought it here crossing other labels you can see now that this particular label is crossing all other grid lines if i take any grid line across any other label that is going to mark you down so under no condition should you use any grid line to cross one another and always make sure that your grid lines are in horizontal lines most preferably all of them going to one side but in a scenario where you have too many labelings you can put a few of them to the left hand side and then we talked about identification of the diagram it is easy for you to identify your diagram now there is what we call cuts. I made mention of cuts earlier on. Now let us look at this. Now looking at this particular mango, this particular mango seed, we notice that the seed was cut from top to bottom. That is why we can see the inner part of the mango. So this particular cut is referred to as the longitudinal cut. Let me quickly show us something. Let's assume we have a fish drawn like this let's assume we have a fish drawn like this and then we have this as the fins we have this as the fins we have this place like this as the operculum we have this place let's assume okay let me put something here like this for the dorsal uh, fin, where there we are, I mean, for uh, for the uh, the side fins, let's assume we have something that looks like this. For the uh, the well, one of the fins, and we have some other here underneath here as well as the fins. Now, looking at this particular diagram, when you look at it from top. When you look at the diagram from top like this, that is referred to as a dorsal view. This is called a dorsal view. When you look at the diagram from above, you are looking at it from above, that is a dorsal view. But when you are looking at it from under, when you look at the diagram from underneath like this, that is referred to as a ventral view. A ventral view view now when you look at the diagram from the front like this 
looking at it from the front like this this is referred to as anterior anterior view and if it is coming from the back it is called the posterior the posterior view also you can look at it directly from the side you can look at it directly from the side like this and that one is referred to as the side view so let me quickly uh, correct this let me quickly correct this so we don't get confused let me do it let me make it uh, better placed Okay, let's let's have it to be this. Let me use the same kind of color so we don't get confused. So I said this one is the ventral view. Here we have the anterior view. Anterior view. Here we have what we refer to as the posterior view. And here we have the side view. So the direction from which you are looking at your diagram depends what the cut will be. So these are the cuts. So we need to understand that. These are the cuts. So the direction from which you look at your diagram determines the cut. And then we also want to look at uh, differentiation. But before I leave the diagrams, I was actually talking about uh, cutting. So Cutting from above, when you have a cut done from the top of the diagram, or uh, sorry, the top of the specimen to the bottom of the specimen, we refer to that as a longitudinal cut. But if it were to be a cut from the sides, from left to right, unlike this one that is from top to bottom, if the cut is from left to right, that one is referred to as a transverse cut. A transverse cut. So longitudinal sorry longitudinal okay let me put let me put it on this other page here so longitudinal longitudinal cut is from top longitudinal cut is from top to bottom well, transverse cuts, transverse cuts is from, transverse cut is from left to right. So in a scenario, like whenever we want to take oranges, we cut them so we'll be able to suck the juice from inside the, uh, the orange. So that particular type of cut that shows our orange to look like this, having this shape. Sorry. Having something like this, such that we'll be able to see some of the things that are inside the orange like this. Yes, this type of cut is referred to as a transverse cut. So that is uh, that about the cut. Now, let me quickly say this. It is very, very important that students pay attention to instructions. Instructions are very, very important. Instructions are very, very important. Let's take another page. Adherence to instructions. Ad Students must be very, very attentive. Attentive and comply. with instructions now we know that you understand the question we know that you know some of these things so the best way for us to mark you is to make sure that you follow all of the instructions that are actually given in the question now there are certain questions that will require you to uh, draw a diagram that is 8 to 10 centimeters long for example and I've shown you how to do that make sure your diagram is not small make sure your diagram is not uh too small for the eyes to see or for the lecturer or for the examiner to mark 
Make sure your diagram is not too minute. Now, we have instances where we probably tell a student to draw uh, the diagram of an insect or a plant with, without certain parts. Let's assume the person was given a cockroach to draw without the wing. Or the person was given a particular plant to draw without a particular part of the plant. Let's assume the, uh, the, uh, the part of the plant that is, uh, ex uh, that is removed is, uh, let's assume, the xylem or something. Now, under no condition must that student draw the diagram with that particular organelle that is being asked to be removed. If the diagram is drawn with that particular uh, supposed detached part, that part that is expected to be absent from the diagram, it only means that the student has not listened attentively to the instruction. So the person or the student will be penalized for that. And then correct spelling matters a whole lot. Correct spelling. It matters very, very much. Make sure, try as much as possible to uh, have your spellings correctly spelled. Corrections uh, for your spelling is going to mark you down. It's going to have a particular uh, ramification. So that is that. Your guidelines have talked about that. Then your details. You try as much as possible to pay attention to details of the diagram that is to be drawn. Now, that is that about a uh, uh, instruction. I said you should comply to instructions always. Always. Always obey all instructions. If a question tells you, for example, to differentiate, differentiate using a table. Now, a lot of students are falling victim of this. Now, you, they will be asked to differentiate using a table. And a whole lot of them will start writing in sentences. That is a very, very bad way. A very, very bad way to go. If you have been taught to differentiate using a table, that means the examiner is expecting you to have a table. So if you have been taught to differentiate between uh, using a table between, let's assume the person has asked you to actually differentiate between a dog and fowl. Under no condition must you do something like this. Now you come around and you start saying, number one, number one, uh, dog has webbed feet, while fowl has digits. Now, you are correct with this point, but because you did not use a table, then it will be what? It will be marked wrong. It will be assumed that you failed it. Let's assume you even gave more points. Number two, you said that a uh, dog lives mostly, lives mostly in water or is an aquatic organism, while fowl is terrestrial. You are actually correct with this point, but because you have not followed the instruction, the instruction said that you use a table. This is very, very important that you must see it. You must be able to see this particular thing that is written here, that you should use a table. It is very, very important. So failure to use that table will make everything you have written here void. So what is expected of you is that you make a table first. You draw your table first. So this is going to be how the table will look. Now I have this. I am going to write here dog and here I'm going to write fowl. And then point one, I said that dog has webbed 
That is my point one. For foul, yeah, I said foul has digits as feet. Now, point two. Dog is majorly aquatic, even though it is found on land, while fowl is terrestrial. I can say that point three. Dog has flat beak. Dog has flat beak. And for the fowl, I say fowl has short beak. Now, these are points that will easily be what marked correctly for me because I have actually followed the instruction of the question. Every question has its own instruction. You must be able to identify those instructions and adhere strictly to it. It is very, very important. So, that is that about that. Now, that is what I have to talk about for differentiation. But if it were to be similarities that you are told to write, similarities are much more easier. So, similarities. Similarities. You can easily say that they both have feathers. Yes, the duck and the fowl, they both have feathers. Number two, they both feed on, let's say you, you want to talk about, okay, they both feed on uh, microbes or macroorganisms. Let's not say micro, macroorganisms because dogs feed on earthworms, so as uh, the fowls, they also feed on earthworms. So you can use this as their similarities. They both have their eyes uh, on the sides of the head. Those are similarities. The, you can see that the similarities can be written in a sentence, but if it is the differentiation and it has been stated in the question that you should use a table, make sure you do not write a sentence. Make sure you will make a table. That is that about that. So the next thing we want to talk about now is experimentation. Yes, this is actually where I want us to dwell now. Experimentation. experimentation now i want us to be very very attentive here the reason is very very simple i want us to be attentive because a lot of students have had issues with this particular aspect of biology practical now when you are given specimen you will probably be told what you are expected to do. So please, for those of us that are taking the YX this year, please kindly look above for uh, a video talking about all the specimens. We've done the analysis of all of the specimens. So you have a possible uh, sight, insight to what the questions can be like. Please go through them and uh, subscribe more to our channel as we bring you more interesting uh, videos. Now, to what we're saying, experimentation. This particular part of the uh, lesson requires you, requires you to talk about a whole lot of things. So, whenever you are recording, whenever you are having an experiment, these are some of the things to do. First and foremost, you need to tell us the aim of your experiment. You tell us the aim of the experiment. Aim. So, to test for starch or test for starch let's assume or let's say a translucent test test for fat that is our aim hmm? to test for fat so you now write out the next point which is going to be your apparatus apparatus so let's assume we are using ground nut Ground nut, you are using ground nut, you are given a specimen, ground nut, 
you are given uh let's say plain a4 paper plain a4 paper uh you are given a hand lens you are given a mortar and pestle okay these are your uh these are your apparatus so you list them out like you have done and then you move to the next one the next step which is the method now the method is where you state what actually is going on in the experiment so method put the ground knot in the motor and crush with pestle that is the first point then point two now this one is the first point point two you say take a little sample a little sample of crushed granite of crushed granite now let me quickly say this if you were given the granite as a specimen let's assume uh, the granite is specimen G it will be told in the question that put specimen G because the, the question will give you the steps to follow so you write your methods based on this uh, steps that have been assigned to that particular experiment so the first step tells you that put specimen uh, G in the motor or crush specimen G then take sample of specimen G. So in place of writing ground knot like I have done here, ground knot, ground knot, you write specimen G. You are not expected to tell them that it is ground knot at that point because it is assumed that you don't know what it is. So you just write specimen G here. You write specimen G here. So let us continue. So take a little sample of the crossed ground knot or let me just write specimen G here of Crushed uh, sample of crushed specimen G and apply on the A4 paper. Point three. Now you are told to uh, leave the crushed specimen D. The crushed specimen G on the paper for 10 minutes and so you are told to come back after that to record whatever you come across and then your conclusion so this is how you do your recording you go to okay let's have a new page we have something like this we have something like this okay let me make it a bit wider. I believe we can see what is being done. So here you have test. Sorry. Here you have test. Here you have observation. And here you have inference. It is from the inference that you'll be able to determine what is actually happening. So let us go back to the previous page now. The first step told us to put the granite in the mortar and crush with pestle. That is what the first step here is telling us. The first method we did, he said put the granite in mortar and crush with pestle. So you come here. You come to the next page here, you say, one, put specimen G in mortar and crush. So what did we observe? In the process of crushing, what did we observe? 
specimen G was crushed into particles. So here you probably can say that it is possible to grind the specimen G as your inference, but that, uh, uh, most times or often times the inference is not easily uh, gotten at the first step. So at this point, you pick your ruler and you make a rule across. You have talked. Uh, we have talked about the first point. Then you go for the second point. Now, the second point, which is this. The second point is talking about. It said, take a little sample of crushed specimen G and apply on the A4 paper. Take a little sample of the specimen G and apply on the A4 paper. So that is what we have now. So this is our. We say that. Apply specimen G on A4 paper. And then under your observation, oily patch was observed on the A4 paper paper so under your inference now you can now say that the patch the patch forms a translucent forms a translucent spot forms a translucent spot so hence we can confirm we can confirm fat and oil so this is an example of how you record your experiment so after you must have done this you also rule again you rule your uh, point again so we have ruled and then let me quickly do this because it is from your inference now that we take this next point here. We have talked about our method, we have talked about observation. So we now have, remember that here we talked about aim apparatus method. So the next thing we can now be talking about, that is the table is supposed to come immediately after your method, as your, that is where you have your observation and inference. And after the table now is now where you'll be having this particular one, which is the conclusion conclusion so the conclusion now excuse me the conclusion now is that okay let me put it this way fat and oil is present that is the conclusion. So the fat and oil is present. That will be the conclusion of that practical or that experiment. So please, we try as much as possible to make sure that you follow all of these uh, uh, steps. One more thing that you could be told is that you identify objects or specimen. You identify specimen. Please, when identifying specimen, Identification of specimen. Identification of specimen. When identifying specimen, let's assume you were given a cockroach. Let's assume you were given a cockroach. You cannot just tell us, with the, the question says identify specimen Q. And specimen Q is cockroach. You don't just write cockroach. This is what you do. You say... Specimen Q, specimen Q has two segmented bodies, two segmented bodies, that is, 
you can give them head then abdomen you can tell them that specimen q if you have space specimen q has wings please it is wings cockroaches do not have feathers it is wings that they have specimen q has wings you can also say that specimen q specimen q has four pairs of legs four pairs of legs therefore therefore specimen q is an arthropod hey therefore specimen q specimen q is an arthropod called or specimen q belongs to the class of the arthropoda called cockroach so that is how you identify your specimen now when you're going into the biology lab uh, or biology exam try as much as possible to have your hb pencil you use hb sharp hp pencil that is what is expected of you you probably be given some other materials that can aid your practical experience you'll be given uh, a hand lens or a microscope i believe we know the a function of those two to magnify objects that is what they are used for so as far as we have come i am sure that with the tips that we have given we will be able to answer uh, the questions the practical questions appropriately and i wish everyone success in their exam please don't forget to subscribe to our channel like our page subscribe like share uh, and also drop your comments let us have your comments we want to have your take on all the videos that you have dropped Thank you very much and God bless.